Hi, and welcome to an episode of the JetRails podcast. I'm Robert Rand, your host. Today, we're going to be talking all about digital merchandising. Uh, I'm joined by Steve from the Citation team, uh, who has built a career uh, and, and a business around digital merchandising and automation around that, uh, you know, really being able to do it on a larger scale. And so who, who better <laughs> in terms of brains to pick on, on such a topic? So Steve, with no further ado, uh, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Sure. Hi, Robert. Thank you for having me. Uh, Steve Engelbrecht, I'm founder and president of Citation. Citation is both a software and services firm in the digital merchandising space. Digital merchandising is sort of a special niche within the e-commerce world. Uh, we don't do digital marketing. That's what a lot of people think when I say digital merchandising. Uh, we don't design websites. We don't manage ad spend. What we do is we're really focused on the data around your presentation of product. Right. So if you think about merchandising in the real world, it's about how stores and shelves are laid out, uh, where the signs are, what, what the words are that appears on the signs to help you navigate the store. This is very similar. In the digital merchandising world, we're thinking about taxonomy, which is our organization of product, both internally and how we present that to a customer, the product data itself, so the specs, the descriptions, the images, videos, uh, other digital assets like PDFs. And then search, which is all about findability. So interacting with that product data to help customers figure out what products they want. Uh, and this is uh, an important field because there's a lot of uh, huge e-commerce stores that are out there. And uh, the better you can do of helping a customer to get to the categories and products that they're interested in, the more likely you are to convert that customer into a, uh, into a paid visit on your website. Awesome. Uh, and... Uh... One of my favorite questions to ask tech companies, how did Citation get its name? So Citation has actually, it's actually been around for a while in terms, of, uh, in terms of tech years. So I'm going to date myself here, but we were founded all the way back in 2001, which is the year that I graduated from, uh, from undergrad. And uh, right after September 11th, I lost my very first job and decided to start a company. And at the time, I was doing more website building, sort of generic web developer, lots of database applications. So I wanted to come up with something that was sort of catchy around the process of making a site. So I took uh, site plus creation. I came up with citation. Very cool. Yeah. Well, you know, speaking of, uh, you know, of, of downturns, you know, uh, obviously 2001 uh, was a unique experience. Uh, 2008 was a unique experience. We're living through um, an extremely unique experience. From your side of the market, have you been seeing anything happen differently as a result of uh, of COVID nineteen and and the coronavirus crisis that uh, that we're all uh, globally impacted by? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a it's really interesting just to see how quickly the world can change and and shift on a dime to. Uh, in terms of customer behavior, right? I mean, literally over the course of a few days when we switched to this uh, stay-at-home kind of model, the shelter-in-place directive that came down, uh, you see people start to buy things online that they never had before, right? So we've even done it here at my house. Welcome to my home office, by the way. Uh, we've started to uh, started to buy groceries online, which we had never done before. Uh, we're buying ice cream online from a, from a small uh, local ice cream shop that, you know, uses all locally sourced ingredients. They just threw together a, a simple web page to try to move some product because they were hurting the same way everybody else was. But really every category you can think of, there's a huge shift to people trying to buy it online. And with that, from the, from the sell side of the equation comes the need to build processes, to build product data, to build a presentation that's strong, uh, to build a, 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 a sequence for managing those orders as you go into fulfillment and of course, feeding that information into some sort of a marketing process to get people to continue buying. Uh, scale that up to the big world. You know, we tend to work with enterprise customers, mid-market to enterprise, and they're suddenly under the same gun, right? And I, I saw an article today that was really interesting that was basically saying that we've gone through, in terms of consumer behavior, years of evolution in a matter of months. Right. So just the way people are shopping, the amount that they're shopping, the the huge jump in the uh, the volume of sales and the categories that are moving now, it just this sudden sudden shift over to uh, to buying all these different categories online creates huge ripples that are going to going to impact virtually every aspect of 
uh, a catalog retailer or a catalog B2B out there pretty much anywhere in the world. Yeah, yeah. And in some ways, it's not even, it, yes, to some extent, it's the consumer buying habit changes, but I'd say, you know, we're also seeing some really resilient business owners and operators that are pivoting. Um, and, you know, so businesses that didn't used to sell any so for, some form of PPE or, um, you know, personal protective equipment, other things that these are businesses that know how to source product, know how to sell product. And so they can help to fill uh, niche and supply lines. And it, it's really, really interesting to see how quickly a business can transform itself. Um, you know, in, in web hosting, where we get to see the jumps in traffic and things in a, uh, a very measurable way. Um, so it, it's a pretty, uh, pretty awesome thing to see businesses um, innovating and uh, taking care of of themselves in a lot of ways while, you know, there's certainly lots of other programs and lots of other things going on. So uh, your team specifically works mid-market and enterprise by and large. Why is it that businesses need help with merchandising? You know, because obviously uh, that's typically something when I think of the term merchandising as in brick and mortar retail, I'm generally thinking of, of somebody that's in the business that's handling it pretty holistically you know, maybe I'm, I just haven't experienced enough of it to see outsource teams come in to help with that. But how does uh, a team like yours interact? Uh, you know, what is it that's missing in these organizations in order to get the job done well? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. So we, we think about, again, thinking about the real world experience, uh, you'd be surprised how much science and how much research and data goes into the planning and execution of where things appear in a physical store, Right. Uh, things like, you know, analyzing the the foot traffic and the demographics of who's in the store, uh, thinking about the price points and the uh, brand awareness of of different of different brands depending on the category that you're in. For instance, in a grocery store, uh, thinking about the the psychology of how someone interacts with an assortment of product, and trying to guide them toward uh, you know more profitable purchases or more popular purchases that are in the store. Uh, all of that happens online as well, right? But the challenge with being online is that you, know, you don't have a physical product that someone is actually working with, right? You do eventually, of course, when they actually buy it and it shows up at your house. But in the e-commerce world, until they make that purchase, the product is the data, right? It, it's all you have to work with. So if we think about uh, processes of how to identify what do customers care about, what information do they need, uh, that's really what drives every decision that we're helping our customers with. What are the information needs of that customer and how can we align our presentation of that product to make it easier, to make it, uh, to lower the, the friction and make it as easy as possible for that customer to find what they want and to be compelled to make a purchase decision. The other side of that is that when you get into, uh, you know, big catalogs and in either in, in retail or in the, B2B world, whether it's a brand or a manufacturer, once you start getting into hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, potentially millions of different products, the challenges around managing a single product are obviously multiplied by that huge number of different products and variants in your catalog, right? So what we tend to see is big companies, uh, you know, despite good intentions, tend to fall into bad habits, right? They tend to be over-reliant on uh, ad hoc processes, things like Excel and email. Uh, you end up with a lot of institutional knowledge where you know one or two people hold the keys to the castle and they are the only people that know how to set up an item in so-and-so ERP so it flows to this PIM and this commerce system and over here. And what we help to do is come in and uh, try to identify opportunities to make all of that move more smoothly, to be more aligned to what customers want so we can scale and we can help that operation to be more profitable. So, you know, that's really interesting that I can remember vividly times where I, in my agency days, I felt like as I tried to get the right product data from a client that I was a ping pong ball and I would get knocked around between departments. Somebody would say, here you go, this is it. Then it would wind up imported, you know, which is a process and takes man hours and takes labor. And then uh, you know, someone else would say, no, 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 you know, that didn't get through our department. Um, from your experience, who in an organization 
is either a, I guess an owner or influencer of that that data. You know, what departments are are supposed to be collaborating, um, and you know, supposed to have some kind of a stakeholder role in getting that data right. Well, I think part of the challenge at a big company of doing this well is that this really is a cross-departmental function. It touches aspects of IT. It touches enterprise architecture. Certainly, it touches marketing and e-commerce operations. And I think, you know, to a certain extent, the, the diffusion of responsibility across different business units is part of what makes it difficult to do, right? There's a lot of coordination that has to happen in order to make sure that you have a scalable process to support uh, new item creation, to support item maintenance, to support flowing information from, uh, for instance, your supply chain vendors to ERP, to your PIM or MDM, to your commerce platform, to your search platform. There's just a lot of coordination that has to happen there. Uh, I think the companies that are doing this really well today, I would say two things are true. Number one, that they've identified a team, or usually it's some aspect of marketing or merchandising operations, who is responsible for product data, right? For all aspects of product data and for that journey from uh, new item set up all the way through publishing it on online. And then the other aspect that I think is even more important is that companies that are really effective uh, in this particular aspect of e-commerce are treating it as a critically important project from the top down, right? The CEO is not only aware of it and funding it, but he or she is uh, deeply involved in driving uh, good processes and best practices internally around PIM, right? And part of that is leveraging a resource like a citation or you know the, some of the different software vendors that are out there mm -hmm. to think about what have been the failings of other organizations, uh, what are things that work and don't work, what are the systems that we could use, what are some of the processes, tools, views, KPIs, et cetera, that we could put in place to make this better. Uh, and this, you know, it all comes down to scale, right? I think the, the better that we can do with our customer to help them identify what do customers care about today and what's starting to trend that they're going to care about in the future, uh, the better they're going to be able to do generally online. Yeah, and I imagine that there are a number of businesses that have been primarily offline um, and that are now, even if they had an online presence, whether, you know, B2B or B2C, um, that they're really struggling now to uh, effectively push as much of that through e-commerce as possible. So I imagine that there are some big catalogs out there that uh, <laughs> that, that are in need of, of a, a little bit of TLC to get them ready for market. Yeah, absolutely true. So this is, you know, everybody talks about how B2B kind of lags behind the retail world, you know, 10, 15 years, right? Um, and that's true. And part of that stickiness, I think, comes on the sales model for these traditional distributors and, and B2Bs that are out there. There's still, many of them are still largely driven by uh, a traditional outbound kind of sales territory model, right? Where somebody is out there knocking on doors, building relationships, counting products on shelves, filling out order sheets, and driving business that way. And, you know, to a certain extent, that works. When does that not work? Uh, you know, a time like now, when you're not allowed to go to that place, right? Yeah, you're not allowed no, to go. No door-to-door, no, -door, no trade shows. Right, uh, exactly. Nobody coming to your showroom. Um, you know, I, I, we had a podcast very recently talking specifically just about moving e-commerce, uh, you know, channels uh, to the forefront in, in B2B. And even things like, uh, you know, we, we had touched on net terms. So being yeah. able to get through that checkout process uh, in a way that doesn't require a bunch of people in some back office that they're not in right now um, to go and do a bunch of paperwork and go check D&B scores manually and file a bunch of things and being able to just let people order naturally and opening up the sales team um, to be able to more effectively get data on what their customers are looking at and what their purchasing habits are and um, being able to to participate with them and not make them fax things back. <laughs> let yeah. them, you know, maybe put put the order into the website for them and let them just accept it and, and accept whatever payment terms through the site. You know, it doesn't always have to displace the sales team. In many cases, it, it opens up the sales team to be free to do more, to accomplish more, to work with more uh, customers more effectively. You know, really, you're, right. you're keeping Absolutely your customers right. happy. You're respecting their time. 
Absolutely right. And that is that is exactly the heart of the you know the, the best practices services model that we take with our customers, right? So we're we want to help them to get to the point that they are doing the value add activities. They're not wasting time on silly things like filling out order forms in triplicate and faxing them to the back office, right? Instead, they're focused on addressing the needs of their customers. We, we, we always say we help our customers to move from a reactive stance where they're, you know, they're putting out fires to instead being proactive, right? Thinking about what will be trending, what, what are our customers, not only what do they need today, but what will they need? What relationships should we be building with new categories, new vendors? Uh, and there's all sorts of different ways that you can see that, right? There's, there's lots of data sources that are out there, including a huge one that's vastly underutilized in the e-commerce world, which is your own enterprise site search logs, right? So one of the key things that we do, one of the key activities that we do with our data and analytics group is that we will help customers to do uh, deep data mining on their search logs to look at what do your customers care about, right? What are the words that they're using? What do they call different categories? What are the brands that they're asking for? Very importantly, what are the attributes that they're asking for? How are they shopping that product, right? And there is a gold mine there, if you do this effectively, of having the opportunity to align and shape that experience in a digital channel to how they're actually asking for that information. And that's really the magic of what we're doing, right? So we're, we're getting in there and we're working on efficient, scalable processes that are three things. Number one, they are data-driven, right? We're not shooting from the hip. We're helping our customers to use the data to find truth. Secondly, they're customer focused, right? We're always thinking about the end user of this, of this uh, digital channel. What are their information needs? What do they need to get where they're going? And thirdly, it's more of an internal view, right? We want to create executive visibility, right? So we want to help our, we want to help our uh, management team, right? So the, the executive level all the way up to the C-suite, give them visibility into the data. What's happening? What's in process, right? What are we currently moving through in, in terms of building new categories or building out your vendor relationships and thinking of it much more of a process than just a, a mess of emails and spreadsheets. Yeah. I think that it's something that a lot of businesses struggle with in terms of understanding how their data impacts them. So, you know, there's the obvious that, Hey, look, you know, if, if you take the same bland data that you'd use in a point of sale where only your sales clerks or, you know, your staff are going to see it, it's not polished. Um, for an end user to read it, really grasp what's going on and appreciate it and be compelled to make a purchase. So, you know, there's the end user that you're speaking to. But then, uh, as you said, you've got site search that if the data doesn't have all the right attributing and um, it, it isn't really well organized, then people aren't going to be able to find it through the search mechanisms. And if it's not, you know, if it's not well organized in terms of categorization, they're not going to find it where they're looking for it through navigation. And if you don't, handle, you know, this range of things, you're probably not going to see any good search engine rankings out of it. So, you know, it's going to impact the SEO, the quality of the data can impact, um, you know, your, uh, your quality scores and, and, you know, page scores and things like uh, Google AdWords, Google Ads. Um, so it, it's such a wide range. Um, I imagine that you also run into multi-channel businesses that need the data uh, to be properly formatted for places like Amazon and eBay, where oh, yeah. what you want to do on your website is one thing, but they've got their own standards. Yeah, absolutely true. So the, the, the systems component to what we do, uh, the, the industry term is PIM or product information management. And citation is not a PIM, right? So we don't, we don't sell a, a PIM of our own, but we do have some technology, right? We have, we have a, a platform that we've built which has grown out of our consulting practice where we keep seeing the same problems at all these big companies that we're working with, right? So we decided to standardize an approach to helping them to do some of these things. And uh, one of those key pieces is helping them to shape the output, that information that's going, that's either coming in from, from different uh, data sources, from third-party you know, licensed content sources, from, uh, from vendors, from internal internally enriched documents, whatever they might be, right? Uh, but helping to shape that to bring them into these centralized systems. But then same thing on the way out, creating a, a process that's scalable and can help you to actually execute on those. And, and I imagine world, so, some of them must even want the data for whatever retailers or resellers if they're farther up the supply chain, if they're the manufacturers or distributors or what have you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you think about, you know, every every system 
that's out there, every channel, whether it's uh, Amazon or eBay or Jet or you know the countless marketplaces that are out there today, each one of them have their own taxonomy, their own attributes, their own file requirements, their own data submission requirements. So building out a robust system of connectors uh, that helps to you know, manipulate and transform that data into the right format to push it downstream. That is the purpose of PIN, right? And that is why it's so important. And compare, you know, thinking about the efficiency of being able to have, you know, a team that's that's trained, that's scalable, uh, that's cross-trained on different functions that can be really focused on data quality, right? And on, on presentation of that information, again, aligning it to the information needs of your customers, rather than desperately trying to you know, edit CSV files or XML files to prepare them to push downstream. I mean, you can see where the efficiency comes in, right? It's much more of a, a, a business process than a, than a ugly rote manual ad hoc technical process. Well, and when you're dealing with things in spreadsheets uh, and, and in pretty raw files, you also run into problems of the quality of the data. So, you know, standardization, it's great that it's all in a spreadsheet, but then you go to upload it into one of your software endpoints like your e-commerce website, and there are errors that there's nothing in that spreadsheet, generally speaking, to catch. Um, right. So now you're dealing with, you know, depending on how you're you're uploading it, if you're pushing it right into the database, uh, you're creating a nightmare for yourself because you just introduced, uh, you know, a, a bunch of things that uh, uh, that don't align with the, the scheme of the database. Um but if not, you know, you're playing hunt and peck in many cases, uh, you know, to figure out why you're having data upload issues and what's going on. You're dealing with it in arrears instead of getting out in, in front of it. Um, seen that one enough times. <laughs> we frequently yeah. joke that Excel is our biggest competitor, right? And this is exactly why. So it's, it's such a low bar to entry that it's easy to get started. And all of a sudden that, hey, can you prepare one file so we could push it to our digital channel? becomes the process, right? And all of a sudden, you know, doing that with 10 products or 50 products even, and that's fine, that's not a big deal. But what happens when your taxonomy starts to grow, right? When, you're, when your needs change, when you have different languages, when you have multiple channels, when you have different versions of product information that are coming in, when you wanna start thinking about uh, product models or product variants where some attributes are shared and there's some variation on those. Mm -hmm. uh, all of that, begs yeah, look, for a system and a process to help support it at scale. Even when it doesn't stop the process or necessarily break anything, it can create a, a lot of issues on the front end. I mean, we've probably all been on a, uh, a fashion site at some point or, or a, you know, a department store's website and you go to look at clothing and they've got, you know, multiple different uh, synonyms in essence in the search filters and in, in the layered navigation or uh, the faceted search where maybe, you know, they've got, uh, you know, M for, for medium, MED for medium, the word, you know, that you've got all these, uh, these different things that don't match up, or you've got something where it's, you know, size seven with a space and size seven without a space. And, you know, that nothing's generally without some software system in place, typos and other things, and just, you know, different people that don't, um, that don't follow the same standardizations are getting data from different sources, from different, uh, you know, different sources of product that may give you a spreadsheet that you're going to splice in things like that. So I'm going to go back to, we, you've brought up PIM a few times. You don't provide a PIM directly. You've got some partners in that space. Uh, by this point, I, I imagine. Um, yep. and so how do, do you see yourself in terms of partnership as an organization? Cause we, you know, we've talked about SEO and site search and, um, and, uh, you know, the process that web developers have to go through dealing with these spreadsheets and things, um, you know, is this something that you find works really well with others? Is it something that really just sits outside of uh, a lot of the industry and, and you really work directly with the end users only? Um, yeah. How does this all kind of play together in, in my usual <laughs> way of thinking of e-commerce taking a village? So I think the, the good news for us I think you know generally not just in the in the context of a of a a huge you know global event like we have now that's generally pushing you know the markets toward e-commerce. That the good news for us is that everybody needs what we do, right? Anybody that has a website needs what we do. Uh, big companies again they 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 tend to end up with some inefficient habits, 
right? So what we're doing is we're, we're trying to help come in and, and build an approach to undo some of that and make them scalable and, and work well, right? I think uh, the key portion of that is that we try to really stay in our lane, right? Be really focused on the actual, on the process work, on the data quality work. And we can be platform agnostic kind of with our, with our customer and on their behalf to, first of all, go through the process of thinking about their stack. Maybe they don't have a PIM right now. Maybe they don't have an MDM, or maybe they're considering uh, an ERP migration, or they're considering a new e-commerce channel that they want to build out. Uh, our approach allows us to be very flexible, especially on the, on the professional services side, with helping the customer to work through that process of documenting their needs, right? Thinking about what are the requirements, what are the nice-to-haves, uh, what are the different processes, the different teams or roles that are going to be involved with all of this. And every big, every big company is different, right? They're all, they're all unique. They've got their own different ways that systems fit together. They've got their, of course, their unique ways of, of selling and you know, part of, of their presentation generally of what they do or what they sell with their customers. So there's no one size fits all. And the, the PIM world, the, the master data world and, and the product information management world have a lot of really great solutions that are out there. Um, and Citation has decided to partner with a few of those directly as an implementation partner. But in addition to that, you know, we see ourselves very much as, as, uh, as being specialists within the world of helping to get the most out of your investment in that sort of technology as you can, right? These systems are not magic bullets, right? You can't solve your digital merchandising problems by buying a PIM because PIM is a lot bigger than that, right? PIM is processes, it's documentation, it's your data model, including your categories and your attributes. It's your job descriptions, it's vendor management, it's data governance, you know, KPIs, all these different pieces. And to really do this well is to have an integrated solution that starts with your vendors and moves that product information in-house and then has a series of steps to, uh, to enrich that information, to store it, and then to efficiently publish it out to your different channels with all the right connectors and touch points in place with your partners in IT or your partners in marketing or your partners in the search team to make sure that you are really treating that as a center of excellence for product data. So, you know, that's, that's the end game. That's where we want to get product data, just like, you know, just like search, just like design, it's never done, right? You're never going to cross it off the list and say, okay, product data is done. Let's, you know, what's next? Because it's always changing, right? There's always new products, there's new categories, there's, uh, you know, the, the market is evolving with what people want or how they want to interact with that product data. Your competitors certainly are never standing still, right? So they're going to be pushing as well. So it's a little bit of a rat race. And, you know, I think really critically, individually, like you said, you might be on an apparel site and you feel frustrated interacting with product data. You know, each of us can relate to that, right? We spend so much time searching and buying online. Everybody has a story like that. And what do we tend to do? we leave, right? You go someplace else where it's a better experience. So the, the tolerance that companies have for their own bad habits is, you know, it's kind of funny in a way because they know individually that it's wrong, but they can't figure out how to fix it, right? And this is a, an approach that we take, again, with a combination of, of software and services and bringing best practices and bringing the, the, the stories of, of what we've seen at companies that have done it well, where we've seen things go terribly wrong, that we can help to move the bar, help to get them to a place where they're starting to address some of those usability challenges that can very quickly turn into improved KPIs and improved profitability in digital channels. Uh, it, it really, you know, it works. Yeah, look, I find that the bigger a company is, the older a lot of the software that they're running internally is, even if they upgrade their website, the places where they're storing and managing data um, you know, typically, you know, the bigger the organization, the more expensive it is to replace the point of sale or ERP or other systems. And I always challenge people, you know, go to those big stores that, you know, that have been around for a long time, you know, st stick your head around the, the counter, see the computer, uh, see what the screen looks like. And right. uh, it, it's going to tell you a lot of that story um, ab about what they're working with and what kind of challenges they might be having. So when you don't find some other system to act as, as some form of data master, um, in order to be more nimble and more flexible, you're limited by your legacy software. So that, that's for sure. But, I, you know, there have been some interesting takeaways here, even for smaller business uh, that's trying to get well organized, like having one person in charge of the data and, uh, and thinking about the data 
uh, your product data in more than one lens. Um, it's not just about the manufacturer that gave you the spreadsheet or about the merchandiser within your organization and their needs, but there's, you know, web development and okay, you know, uh, e-commerce management, how are you going to leverage that data to create search filters and different things within the site to make it navigable by shoppers? Um, you know, how, are you, how is this going to impact your marketing campaigns and other things? So, um, you know, I, I feel good about, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, about this as sort of the, uh, I think one of the, the optimization trends, because that's always, you look at any facet of e-commerce and you can add the word optimization somewhere in the back end of it, um, that this is one of the, those areas that doesn't always get as much attention. Yeah. Why we, you know, appreciate you coming to, to chat about it today. So, uh, would, you know, are there unique case studies that, that you've gotten to put together over time where, you know, where you were surprised at, at the impacts that digital merchandising has been able to have. Um, I, I know that your team has a history w with some pretty well-established organizations. Yeah. Uh, you know, anything that comes to mind in particular? Yeah. So w without naming names here, um, uh, I can share. Oh, you can name names. I don't mind. It's Okay. <laughs> I would share sort of sort of generally why this can work, right? So, if you think about a single a single product, right? Our team might might help to refine the approach that at some point touches a single product, right? So maybe that's that we are uh, helping with our our content team to go out and, and capture some additional product data that's missing for that particular product record, or we think about the work that we do at the category level where we're looking at uh, what's the model that you've defined in terms of the attributes, what questions are you asking for storing information that will be presented to a customer when they're shopping that category? Right? Each of these, they're, they're small pieces, right? They're only going to impact customers that are shopping that particular product or that particular category. So in order to get the benefit, you know, we're touching lots and lots of, of small portions of the big picture, right? We're touching lots of categories. We're touching lots of products, we're touching lots of keywords that are impacting the site search and the SEO experience. And you know, the, the magic happens here because if we are helping to create small lifts across many products, across many categories, and if you think about the, the, the series of, of percentages of conversion that happen from you know, what's the uh, initial click-through rate, right? What's the What's the uh, the number of, of of clicks to products that we see off of a off of a search or a browse experience on a site, and then what's the add to cart percentage? You know, what's the actual checkout percentage? And we can come up with some important numbers. Uh, the two that we like to talk about in the at a big picture, uh, where all of this wraps up in terms of digital merchandising, is the first one is your session value. Right, this is a really powerful KPI because what this tells you is on average, how much is a visitor to your website worth, right? We don't care about uh, conversion rates and with this particular number. We do, but it's baked into it. Uh, we don't care about your average order value. All we care about is when somebody gets to the site, on average, how much are they going to spend, right? If we think about how we can impact that number, we can make the website better at getting people to take out their wallet and make a purchase, right? How do we do that? Well, we're working on taxonomy. We're working on the product data. We're working on search, right? The flip side of that is how can we get more people to that website so that they can spend that session value, right? So we think about upping the traffic. Uh, and in our world, from the digital merchandising world, that comes in two flavors. That is, well, three maybe. Outside of your firewall, we're thinking about marketplaces, pay-per-click, and SEO, right? And SEO especially is directly impacted by what we're doing because Google looks at well-merchandised sites as really powerful indicators that uh, it's going to help connect customers to what they want, All right? So if you think about those two numbers, what is it worth to me as a merchant when somebody comes to my site, and how can I get more people to come to my site? Those are really the only two numbers that matter at a high level to bring this in terms of messaging to a CEO and say, here is the core argument for digital merchandising: get people to spend more and get more people to come there so that they can spend that money, right? So when you think about it in, in that way, you think about all of the different categories we need to touch, all the different products we need to touch, it can feel, you know, it can feel insurmountable. Like it's, it's huge, right? But when we do it with a data-driven process that's aligned to the customer's needs, we can create an approach that does scale, right? And making those micro adjustments to conversion rates across the full catalog 
can equal big dollars. We have one customer in the B2B world where doing uh, that exact series of steps where we started with taxonomy, then we moved into search, and then we worked on product data, uh, equaled a durable, ongoing $100 million benefit to the bottom line annually, right? Uh, I like to joke, we only charged them half that. No, we didn't. It was, it was, uh, it was you know, relative to the benefit that they got, it was not a big spend. It was a lot of work uh, that was touching many different departments at that company, but you know, a huge benefit that comes out of that. And uh, that is what you can expect, right? If you, if you uh, take this seriously, you look at the potential. I mean, this truly does work. This is like becoming a better salesman in person, but you're helping your entire web infrastructure to be a better salesperson to any digital visitor that should come along and interact with your catalog. Yeah, well, and I would add that it's never too early to work on getting your data right and work on best practices for these things that, you know, so often it's about getting the site up and running and conversion rate optimization and, uh, and, and marketing spend and, you know, a lot of other things, but, you know, same way that, you know, getting your shipping policies, right. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and negotiating the right shipping rates and things, you know, helping yourselves on the back end can b- be tremendous, uh, to an overall business that there's a lot of back of the house that sometimes gets overlooked. Uh, but, uh, and if you're scaling, I mean, realistically, if you're going from small to medium, um, you know, if, if you're hitting the mid market, if you're, uh, still using spreadsheets and still, you know, trying to organize everything, uh, you know, the, the old fashioned way, you know, it's admirable that, <laughs> that you're growing and, uh, and still doing that. But, um, you know, like with every other kind of optimization, it's always about where are your efforts best spent? Where, uh, is your team going to really bring you the most value? Um, you know, I, I never really, uh, think about these as displacing people that I, I rarely see that as the case, any of these technology improvements, it's, it's all about, uh, working more efficiently as a business. Um, you know, reallocating totally staffing. This is a fiercely competitive world in e-commerce and it's only going to get more so, right? So the, the better job that you can do of uh, helping that customer to find what they want quickly and with as little stress and friction as possible, the more likely you are to earn that customer's business. That's the bottom line. Yeah. So this has been a, a fun conversation about digital merchandising. I don't think I've ever had this long a conversation on that particular topic. So... <laughs> Fun Bring stuff. Next week when we talk about paint drying, right? Yeah, no, no. I've, I've, I think we've had episodes that uh, are more likely to be listened to over and over again. Uh, you know, just to help people fall asleep. This has been fantastic. It's, it's really great. Um, so, Steve, before I, I let you go, any final thoughts or uh, anything else to add before we wrap? Yeah, I guess one more would be, you know, given all the changes that are happening in the world right now. Uh, Everyone, you know, we've seen this too. And in fact, we're doing the same thing as an organization. The, the natural inclination is to conserve cash and be super conservative and try to wait it out. You know, I think the smart bets to be made right now are in uh, addressing the rapidly changing market. I think the smartest companies out there are investing and rapidly adapting right now. That's the opportunity that we see, uh, regardless of the category that you're in, you are impacted by what's happening right now. Uh, look at look at the changes that Amazon has made, that Target has made, that Shopify has made. These are big companies that are turning on a dime to change their business models to address a rapidly changing market, right? And uh, I think any company that's that's in that world, regardless of the category, regardless of your business model, if you are selling online, you need to think about how this is going to change your world. Uh, we'd love to be part of that conversation. Awesome. Well. Steve, really a pleasure having you today uh, on the podcast. For our listeners, a quick public service announcement. If you know a business that needs help right now uh, in the e-commerce world, either getting into e-commerce for the first time or uh, evolving or dealing with particular issues right now that have come up as a result of our world being just a bit upside down, uh, I'm going to share some links in the show description in the notes. Um, Additionally, uh, for our loyal listeners, uh, you know, we appreciate all, all of those uh, that subscribe and that, that like and that comment and share, even if it's, uh, yeah, even if it's, uh, you know, something that uh, you think could be done better or differently. We love to hear from you. So we're at Jet Rails, uh, wherever 
you're looking for us on uh, on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, um, certainly wherever you listen to podcasts, uh, and and you can watch the full videos on Facebook and and YouTube of pretty much all of our episodes. Uh, and with that, um, you know, stay safe, stay healthy, and happy selling. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>